have. Well, good evening. It's really nice to be here. <laughs> I wasn't actually expecting to be back in the UK, as Gareth said, but um, uh, while I'm having all the medical things figured out, it's actually been a real treat just to be back in Trinity and reconnecting with friends and um, meeting new people as well. There's so many faces that I don't recognize, and so it's, it's nice <laughs> to meet you. Um, so yeah, so it's been a really great series, hasn't it? Looking at daring faith. Um, it's a little bit scary at times, but we've been looking at um, basically starting with what it means to imagine, have faith to imagine and to dream big because we've got a massive God. Um, we've been looking at what it means to really give our best, the challenge of giving God everything, what that really means to walk with him. Um, looking at uh, daring to plant in faith and also looking at the difficulties of sometimes waiting um, on God as well. And so today, this is the last one in our series, and we're looking at what it means to go in faith. So I'm excited to have this topic because, um, as Gareth mentioned, I've been on my own journey of um, following God and hearing his call to go and stepping out and seeing what that looks like. Um, so before we get going, some of you might be thinking, oh, here's a missionary who's been overseas talking about going. Uh, I'm not called overseas, so I'm probably just going to take the opportunity to catch up on my Facebook feed uh, and just, you know, check out for the next half hour, um, which of course you're welcome to do. Um, but I just wanted to uh, start the talk by saying, actually, this call to go is for every single person in this room who would call Jesus their Lord and Savior. So Jesus said in uh, one Acts um, that basically you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. So if you want to put that into our context here, he's saying you will be my witnesses in Cheltenham, in all of Gloucestershire, in the UK, and to the ends of the earth. So insert country here, whatever God might be saying to you. So this really is for everybody, this call to go. And we see this amazing theme of go running all the way through um, the Bible. We've got Noah, go and build an ark. Okay. Um, we've got Abraham, go and leave your, your home and your family and your father and go to a place that I take you to. There's Moses, who said, go back to Egypt and then go into the wilderness. And then Joshua, go into the promised land. You've got Jonah, go to Nineveh. And uh, so this is not just a call to us today. This is something that has been God's plan from the very, very start is this go. He calls us to action. He calls us to the front lines. And of course, it, go was a very clear theme in Jesus's message as well. And in fact, when we look at the, the message of Jesus and, and all that he said, you could summarize it in just two words. There's come and there's go. So there's come. Anyone who is burdened and weary and weak, come. Come anyone who is lost. Come anyone who is thirsty and I'll give you water. We're all called to come. This calling is not just for, for us Christians in church, come, you know, when, when we need a top up of God, but this is a come, all you people outside the church as well, come you 100,000 plus people in Cheltenham who aren't worshiping God and haven't encountered him yet, come, come to Jesus, everybody is welcome. And we see, of course, Jesus called his disciples, come, follow me. But he didn't stop there. He said, come follow me and I will make you fishers of men. He said, come to me. I will turn you around. I will change your lives. I will change your hearts. I will give you purpose and I will send you to go and be fishers of men. It's never just a passive come and just sit and be still. He gives us that purpose to go as well. And all through the Gospels we see it. He said to the woman at Bethany, go in peace. He said to Legion, the man who had the demons driven out, go back to your hometown and tell them what God has done for you. And of course, there's the Great Commission, which we're all very familiar with in Matthew 28, where he says, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples. There's this constant flow of coming to God, drinking from the source, and then giving of the source to the people around us. We are called to be active people on the front lines. And like I said, this is all of us. This isn't just people who are particularly gifted in evangelism. This is about seeing the spirit and the presence and the kingdom of God break through in every single area of our lives, whether it's at work, whether it's walking down the streets, whether it's an encounter at a hospital, whatever it is, this is about God's glory. And so when we're 
thinking about what does it mean to go. There's a lot of ways that we can go. There's a lot of places that we can go. How do we really discern what God is calling us to do and where he wants us to go? And, you know, sometimes I think it's a little bit tempting to think, well, you know, life is really busy. Like, I'm guilty of this. And I think, God, I'm just about managing to hold together all of the responsibilities that I have. And it will be different for everyone. It might be, you know, my kids are just taking up all my time and energy. You know, it might be my studies. This Writing this dissertation is just taking everything out of me. It might be your work. It might be starting a new business. Whatever it might be, sometimes it can feel like go and reach the lost is like this kind of awkward extra that is just a bit of a pressure. It's a bit, I suppose I should because God says so. But actually, it's far more than just an added thing that we do as Christians because God tells us to. And so basically, what we're going to look at tonight is just what it means to encounter God's heart and be stirred by him to go. And it always starts with Who is God and the person of Jesus? It's not a case of going because I have to go. It's encountering God and really understanding who God is. And then in the context of that, we then begin to understand our purpose. So I just want to read to you um, from Colossians 1, um, verse 15 onwards. And as I read this, just feel your hearts coming alive as we talk about who Jesus is and what it really means to encounter him. This says here of Jesus that he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things are created by him and for him. He is before all things and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have his fullness dwell in him and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. And once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior, But now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. I love that. I think that might be my favorite part of the whole Bible. (laughs) But can you feel it? Can you feel that? Yes, God. Yes, Jesus. In Revelation 4, 11, it says, You are worthy, O Lord our God, to receive glory and honor and power For you created everything, and it is for your pleasure that they existed and were created. God is worthy of our praise. And not just our praise, this small percentage of people who are sitting in churches and willing to give our lives over to him. He is worthy of the praises of all of creation. Everything, everyone, every tribe, every tongue, every people group. And we know that this is God's plan for heaven, that all of these people will be represented. God's desire and God's will is to have people, all people, under his care and in his presence for all of eternity. And he is so worth our worship. John Piper says that missions is not the ultimate goal of the church. Worship is. Missions exist because worship doesn't. Worship is ultimate, not missions, because God is ultimate, not man. When this age is over and the countless millions of the redeemed fall on their faces before the throne of God, missions will be no more. It is a temporary necessity, but worship abides forever. And we want that party in heaven to be as big as possible because God deserves it. And the thing about worship is, it's not that God needs our worship. It's not because somehow he's like, just love me more. It's actually that when we worship, and when we love him, and when we adore him, it's an expression of the true reality of how things really are. So God is above everything, and he loves us. And when we worship, it's like we give that back to him. We say, yeah, we acknowledge who you are. We acknowledge what you've done. And actually, when we stand in the presence of what God has done and who he is, then worship is the only natural response that we can make. Here is this God 
who has all of the glory, all of the power, all of the honor, and he entered into his creation as a human being. He humbled himself, and not only did he come down to the earth, he allowed his creation to kill him in the most awful, shameful, painful, brutal way, just so that the barriers between us and God could be removed, and so that we could enter into this relationship with him. This is why we go to our neighbors. This is why we're called to be witnesses. This is good news. And we are called to be witnesses, each and every one of us. In Mark 12, 30, um, when Jesus was asked, what, what is the most important commandment? He said, the first one is this, love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and with all your strength. And the second is this, to love your neighbor as yourself. And this is a gospel of love that we're inviting people into. And uh, I remember about four years ago, um, God really spoke to me about this. I was um, traveling with a group of friends. We were doing some backpacking up in the, the Rocky Mountains. And we'd been traveling all day and we were exhausted. And we arrived at this motel in kind of this one horse town. Um, and it was really late at night. We just wanted to go to bed. And um, anyway, so we get into the room and you know, start sort of unpacking and settling. And then we realized there's no toilet paper in the bathroom. So I drew the short straw and they were like, oh, go on, go over to the reception and get some toilet rolls. So, so off I go. And it must have been about two o'clock in the morning or something. And um, so I get to the reception and, and this lady was sitting behind the desk and um, she looked like she'd been a bit teary-eyed and had maybe been crying. And, um, and I said to her, are you okay? And uh, she said, no. No, I, I'm really not. And she kind of started launching into this story, her whole life story of these terrible things that had happened to her. And she just kept talking and talking and talking. And uh, so I'm there kind of tapping my foot, like, you know, it's two in the morning. <laughs> and so I thought, you know, when she pauses for breath, I'll make my excuses, get my toilet roll, and I'll go. And uh, so I'm waiting, waiting. and. She just keeps going. This woman just did not breathe. And literally about 10 minutes later, like I'm still nodding and smiling in a polite way, but inside I'm like, ah, I just want toilet roll. <laughs> so tired. And it was just interesting, like in that moment of like total frustration, I heard that small voice of God asking me, are you prepared to listen to this woman and love her and respect and value her in the way that I do? And as this woman just, you know, was carrying on talking about this terrible life that she'd had, like I felt like God was just starting to break my heart for her. He was starting to show me the love that he had for her. And I felt really challenged where I'd been kind of wanting to rush off. And I almost missed an opportunity because I hadn't caught the love of God for this woman. And um, anyway, we carried on uh, me standing there and her talking, and then eventually, I don't know how long it took, but eventually she kind of stopped talking and she said, and that's why I'm not okay. And there is no other response to that other than, can I pray for you? <laughs> so we sat down behind the desk and, and I, I prayed for her and, and um, you know, I sort of prayed into each one of the things that she had sort of listed and, you know, just asked that God would break in. And it was really extraordinary because um, after I finished praying for her, she said, that was amazing. And uh, I said, oh, great, did, did you feel something? And, and she said, you remembered, you actually listened to what I was saying and you remembered what I told you. She said, I've never felt so cared for. Like no one has ever listened to that story before and actually taken an interest. And she said, thank you so much, I feel completely different. And it was interesting because that was about four years ago. And I got an email from her two months ago, and I didn't even remember giving her my email, but she said, oh, do you remember me? It's, uh, you know, it's Marilyn from the, the motel. She said, I just wanted to tell you that since you prayed for me that night, everything has been different, and I now pray regularly. And she said, I just feel like a, a different person. And I just thought, gosh, I nearly walked away from that because I didn't catch the heart of God. And it's really that simple. It really is just that simple. This is, uh, this is a gospel of love. And as we encounter God's love and respond to his love for us, then we begin to uh, grow in our own love. And as Paul said, um, God's love compels us. 
and I don't ever want to let that love go to waste and go cold. It says in Luke 19.10 that Jesus is always actively looking to seek and save the lost. And in John 20, 21, it says that he calls us into that purpose as well. As the Father sent Jesus, so he sends us. And you know, it strikes me that if Jesus is always looking to seek and save the lost, if we're following him, then it makes perfect sense that he would lead us to the lost. And so this is a really challenging question. Are we being led to the lost? Are we really following Jesus? It's something to sit before the Lord with. And, uh, and definitely pray into. And where Jesus brings uh, opportunities for us um, to encounter the lost and see him at work, there's really only one thing that he requires of us, and that is willingness and obedience. It's not about having all of the right answers and these you know, Bible verses to throw at people and all the rest of it, although they can be helpful. Really, it's willingness and obedience that unlocks doors to really step into the purposes and plans that God has for us. And uh, I remember the moment when I committed that to God. It was 11 years ago. (laughs) And um, some of you might know Simon Gilbo. He's um, a missionary out in Burundi. And he was standing up on this stage. And I was sitting over there somewhere. And um, his message was very simple. He said, you know, if you're wondering what God has for you to do, what what his purpose and plan is for your life. He said, it's very simple. All you do is say to him, God, I will go anywhere and I will do anything for you. You just let me know. And so I I thought, you know, I was quite happy with my life in Cheltenham and, you know, great job, great friends, good ministry. And I thought that makes sense, you know, to, to kind of give my willingness to God in that way. And uh, so I came up for prayer afterwards and I I committed to to that statement. (laughs) And I had no idea what was going to come next. (laughs) It was literally that week that God started to unravel this calling to China, which really took me by surprise. Um, And of course, a couple of years later, then I ended up moving out there. So it's a huge prayer. It's a big commitment to say, God, I'm willing. But I wonder, are you guys willing today? Do you want to see God do amazing things in you and through you? because it's willingness that opens that door. It's willingness that will unlock it. And sometimes it can feel like the task is huge, like so huge, too huge. (laughs) Um, But don't worry, because God promises that he will equip us for the task. In 2 Corinthians 9, 8 to 9, it says, and God is able to make all grace abound to you so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work, which is very encouraging. God's got it covered. Somebody once said to me as I was preparing to go to China that, that God will never order anything that he's not prepared to pay for. And finances was something that I really struggled to trust God with because finances just seem so finite. It's like you have it or you don't. You have this number or you have this number. It's, it's like, oh my gosh, that's going to take a huge miracle to bring the finances together to go to China. Um, but actually, there was miracle after miracle after miracle in terms of people's generosity, a massive tax rebate that came out of nowhere at just the right time um, that actually ended up paying for, for me to be able to go. Um, and not just for me, actually. I was able to sew into projects and all sorts of things because God really did provide. And he never orders anything he doesn't pay for. But he doesn't just provide financially. He gives us wisdom. Um, He provides us with opportunities and open doors, meeting the right people at just the right time to see his purposes outworked and to draw us into those. And I think one of the the biggest resources um, that God gives us, one of the biggest gifts, is actually each other. I know that um, when God first started talking to me about China, like I said, I was pretty surprised. I wasn't looking to be a missionary. I wasn't expecting to to go overseas. But actually, what was really good was to be able to say to people around me, like, "I, I think God is calling me to China. What do you think? And so my life group, the leadership in the church, friends and family really got around me. And together, we really weighed it up. We, we prayed intensely about it. We laid out 
many, many fleeces and, and waited for God to speak into that. So actually, by the time I was ready to, to sort of get on that plane and go, there was such a crowd of people behind me who had seen God at work and who were really on board and in this mission with me. And there's no way that I could have done it without people. And of course, we were never designed to be lone rangers when it comes to seeing the gospel spread throughout the world. When Jesus sent out the 72, he sent them in pairs. Paul and Barnabas traveled together. And we see in the New Testament lots and lots of names of the co-laborers that, um, that Paul describes, like Priscilla and Aquila and Silas and, and Timothy. These were all people who were working together to see this gospel spread. And God created us to be in community. God's plan to see the whole world reached for him is actually the church. This is the bride that he's coming back for. God loves the church. And actually, we need to love the church too, to sow in, to support one another, to love one another. We are the body. So often we see in the New Testament the, the body as a description of um, who we are in Jesus. And everyone has a part to play, and we're very diverse. But this is God's plan. When we mobilize as the church and really get on board with God's plan, in this generation, we may well see the Great Commission completed. And wouldn't that be exciting? Every tribe, every tongue. <laughs> In Hebrews 13, 20 to 21, it says, Now may the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, equip you with everything good for doing his will, and may he work in us what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever and ever. And I love that little piece of scripture. It's such a big encouragement. Because not only does it say that God will equip us to do the, the works that he's set before us, but also that he will transform us. He will create in us what is pleasing to him. He changes our hearts as we step out and do what he's called us to do. And he brings us through to maturity. And so often, I'm sure many of you will have experienced, but also looking at characters in the Bible, that it's through faith being stretched and stepping out and that faith being tested is when we grow the most, is when we mature the deepest and you know sometimes going out on a limb for Jesus can be scary it can look like foolishness there's often people who say what are you doing like when I went out to the Middle East a lot of people said what are you thinking going out to the you know a Muslim country as a single woman uh, well, what are you what are you doing that for but actually it's entrusting God and saying I believe in what you've said and I trust that you'll come through that we can step out and as we kind of push that comfort zone as God is faithful our comfort zone begins to grow. And what used to be outside of our comfort zone is now very comfortably within our comfort zone. And we keep on moving forward. We keep pushing the front lines forward, forward, forward all the time to see his glory come. And Jesus came to give us life and life to the full. So expect an adventure. It's good. But we also should be expecting that we might see some storms along the way as well. You know, it's not all uh, unicorns and rainbows. <laughs> Anyone will know that if you've lived um, any kind of life in this world. And actually, the disciples were kind of familiar with this concept as well. Um, in Luke 8, verse 22 to 25, we read that uh, it says, One day Jesus said to his disciples, Let's cross over to the other side of the lake. So they got into the boat and they set out. And as they sailed, he fell asleep. And a squall came down on the lake so that the boat was being swamped and they were in very great danger. And the disciples went and woke him, saying, Master, Master, we're going to drown. And he got up and he rebuked the wind and the raging waters, and the storm subsided, and all was calm. And where is your faith, he asked his disciples. You know, I think what's really interesting with this story is that the disciples were doing exactly what God had asked them to do. They were in the center of his will. Jesus said, let's get in the boat and cross to the other side. And so that's what they did. They got in the boat and went to cross to the other side, but the storm came right in the middle of it all. And isn't that a familiar story to us? You know, sometimes we feel like, I did what you asked me to do, God. You know, I'm in the center of your will, and yet why is this circumstance popped up? Why are you asleep? Don't you care? You know, have you abandoned me? Has your love failed me? But actually, what we need to remember is that Jesus is in the boat. He's always in the boat. And his presence changes absolutely everything. And you know, sometimes God can allow these storms to come because what it causes us to do is dig in, 
to persevere and he changes our hearts. He makes us solid for him. We're not tossed around by the waves anymore like little children. He brings us to maturity where we stand firm and stand strong and say, my God is good and I trust that he will come through for me. And that's what maturity looks like. And of course, Jesus had his own experience of this as well. You'll remember the story of Jesus' baptism where you know, the, the spirit came down like a dove and the voice from heaven saying, this is my son, I'm well pleased with him. It was like this mountaintop experience. But then immediately afterwards, he was led by the spirit into the wilderness to be tested by Satan for 40 days. It's like the spirit of God led him to a difficult place. But the story doesn't end there, thankfully, because when he came out of the wilderness again, we read that he came out in the power of the Spirit, and that was when his public ministry began. There was something incredibly precious and important that happened in that wilderness, in that testing, in that time that was probably not a very pleasant experience that actually enabled Jesus to be filled with the Spirit, come out in his power, and to start his ministry. And so if you are finding yourself in the storm, hang in there. Jesus is in the boat, and God has something good up his sleeve. Like, I speak to myself when I say that, where I'm, you know, I was on the mission field, had to come back for medical things, and I'm finding myself in this in-between season, and like, trusting God to take me back. It's something that he's been taking me through very personally. But I feel faith rise, you know, when I see these stories, and I, I read about the goodness of God, and can say, yeah, I trust him. This storm will end, and he is good and his purposes will stand forever. In uh, Romans 5, 3 to 5, it says, we also rejoice at our suffering because we know that suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance produces character and character hope. And that hope doesn't disappoint us because God has poured out his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit whom he has given us. So actually, through this suffering, we can persevere. Our characters are shifted and changed, we mature and we see good things happen. So the last point um, is that God, when he sends us, he sends us in the power of the Spirit, much like he did with Jesus when he came out of that wilderness time. And in 1 Thessalonians 1, 5, it says, our gospel came to you not simply with words, but also with power, with the Holy Spirit, and with deep conviction. And in Acts 1, 8, that I mentioned earlier, it says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the ends of the earth. And there is something extraordinary that happens when we partner with the Holy Spirit where we see at Pentecost, the disciples were kind of bundled up in the upper room. They're terrified, they're confused. They don't know what's going on. All they know is that Jesus said to wait. And then we see the Holy Spirit come and immediately these terrified guys get up, they leave the upper room, they go into the streets and start preaching boldly the gospel. Something extraordinary happens when the Holy Spirit comes on us and empowers us to go and preach the gospel and share the good news of who Jesus is. And so let's dream big. Let's expect big things. Let's not think, oh, that person... Uh, they're never gonna. They're never gonna engage with God. I'm just. I'm. You know. I'll save that conversation for another time or whatever it is. Like, let's be brave. Let's cross that room. Let's go across the the playground to the mums on the other corner. You know. Let's go across the ward. Speak to the other nurses. Whatever it is that your context might be. Let's be brave and expect big things because God is a great big God. And this is our mission. This is the mandate that He's given us. This is our calling. And we see in uh, Matthew 11, it says that his kingdom is forcefully advancing and forceful men take hold of it. This is not passive. This is active. This is the front line that we're being called to. And you'll notice that it says that his kingdom is forcefully advancing. God initiates, and then it's forceful men that take hold of it. We get on board with what God is already doing. And that's how this works. It's dynamite. It's explosive. This is active. It's exciting to be part of God's purposes. So, the Great Commission, Matthew 28, 18. All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I've commanded you. And surely I will be with you always 
to the very end of the age. This is our great commission. And tonight, I want to ask you guys, as I ask myself, are we prepared to commit to this great commission again? Are we prepared to start planting and giving God our best, to start dreaming big and expecting to see God do big things, whether it's here, whether it's in another country, whether it's in another city in England, wherever it might be, whatever our purposes are, are we prepared to get on board with what God is doing in our lives? So why don't we stand up?